morning to everyone here in Lviv and also to uh, those who are joining from Ternopil. I understand that uh, although I can't see you, uh, the audience is, is uh, quite large for this event. So uh, we are now about one week away from the possible signing of the association agreement. We're now about one week away from the, uh, the possible signing of the association agreement and DCFTA uh, at the Vilnius conference. Uh, I think there have probably been millions of different words spoken and written in the past few months uh, about this event and about the prospects for signature. What Ukraine needs to do, what the EU needs to do in order that the signature of this document can take place. But I'm not going to talk about any of those things today. Uh, because far less has been said and written about what happens after Vilnius. Um, as we all know, the signature of this agreement is not the end of the story. Uh, it, it will in itself not lead to any changes in the circumstances in which companies do business in this country. It will not lead to any changes in the economy and, and economic potential of this country. The signature is just a beginning. So I'm going to focus today on the future. Uh, what will the implementation of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement bring for Ukraine. And I'm focusing on the DCFTA uh, because it is the central element of the association agreement. It's literally the largest part of the agreement. In fact, my original idea was to bring with me a, a copy of the agreement to show you the, the size of it and, and how much was the DCFTA, but our minibus was not big enough, so I, I just bought a small portion of it. Um, also, I think that the DCFTA is the part of the agreement which is most likely to have the most impact on daily life and business life in this country. Uh, and also, it's the part I know best, so uh, it makes sense for me to, to focus on it. I want to start with a, a claim that I don't make lightly. I think that if the DCFTA is implemented fully in Ukraine, it will completely revolutionize not only the economic trade and investment relationship between the EU and Ukraine, but the whole economic landscape of this country. The business and investment climate will improve, and, uh, and that will have benefits for all citizens in Ukraine. Let me explain why I believe this by running through the main elements of the DCFTA in some detail. I want to explain what the DCFTA will do and what benefits it will have both for businesses and for the general population of Ukraine. Now, the classic part of any free trade area is a bilateral agreement between the two parties to remove or reduce customs tariffs and quotas. The aim is to boost trade between partners by opening up each other's markets, thereby creating opportunities for businesses and economic growth for both parties. The DC, DCFTA does this in a, in a very ambitious way. When it's fully implemented, 98% in terms of value of uh, uh, tariffs will be uh, reduced to zero. For the other 2%, the current tariffs will be reduced. So for 98% of the trade flowing between Ukraine and the EU, exporters on both sides will gain better market access to each other's markets. This, of course, is particularly important for Ukraine in the agricultural sector, where I think we can expect to see increased exports to the EU in the very early stages of the implementation. But, of course, there are opportunities for growth in exports for all Ukrainian businesses. You have one of the largest single markets in the world on your doorstep, uh, and, and, and there is enormous potential there, over 500 million uh, potential customers. Export tariffs will also be completely prohibited from the date of entry into force of the free trade area, uh, and, uh, but the import tariffs will be dismantled gradually over a period of up to 10 years. Uh, the timetable is, is unusual as it is asymmetrical, meaning that the EU will lower many of its tariffs and increase many of its quotas much earlier than Ukraine. This gives Ukrainian businesses an opportunity to enter the EU market while allowing time to adjust to the new circumstances domestically. And I want to give you a couple of very specific examples of how this is going to work, because very often we talk about this in general, and I, I just want to show you some examples. Uh, so let's take vegetables and dairy products. Now, 
in the negotiations, both sides made concessions in this area. So for vegetables, for example, uh, the EU will remove its tariffs, lower them to zero, on day one of the implementation of the agreement. Ukraine will reduce its tariffs to zero, but only after three years or five years, depending on the individual product. In a few cases, for certain sensitive products, the tariffs will only be reduced by 50%. In the dairy sector, the EU is going to reduce its tariffs for cheeses uh, uh, to zero from day one, and it will increase its import quotas for milks, for yogurts, for milk powders, for butter, for dairy spreads, over a period of five years. Ukraine, on the other hand, will uh, only allow the EU access, uh, free access, down to zero tariffs for most cheeses after five years. And for the butters, the milk uh, powders, the dairy spread, and so on, the tariffs will be reduced by 20% over a period of five years. So you can see this asymmetrical approach, which favours Ukrainian exporters. It was a deliberate concession on the European side to do this uh, in the negotiations. But the picture is very complicated and you really have to study each tariff line in the schedules that are attached to the agreement to see exactly what's going to happen for individual products. But to summarise, all of these lower tariffs are going to lead first to lower costs for businesses which trade between the EU and Ukraine. Uh, we've estimated that Ukrainian exporters will save around about 500 million euros per year due to reduced customs duties. Ukrainian agriculture will benefit from most cuts, around about 330 million for agricultural products and around about 50 million for processed agricultural products. Reduced tariffs would lead to more competition and that will lead to lower prices for consumers. Now, I'm not going to pretend this whole process is going to be easy. Um, and of course, uh, there have been some Ukrainian businesses which are concerned about the changes. They're concerned about the impact of the removal of the current protection that they have. But as I've explained, um, Ukraine's negotiators have given Ukrainian businesses time to adjust, and they've given opportunities to seize in the EU uh, while they do that, while they make that adjustment. And so I'm convinced that over time, new imported technologies will lead to higher productivity, higher wages, economic growth, new employment opportunities, and so on. It's the pattern that we've seen in other cases where free trade areas have, have led to these developments. In some of the most sensitive areas, the tariff reductions will be phased in over a period of up to 10 years, which is quite unprecedented for the EU. We normally don't go beyond seven years. Um, and this relates in particular to the automotive center, uh, the automotive sector, which is a very sensitive one for Ukraine. Now, I've also heard the complaint from Ukraine, um, from Ukrainian businesses, I should say, that they will suffer more than EU businesses because Ukraine overall is going to have to reduce its tariffs more than the EU. And it's true, uh, the EU already has relatively low tariffs compared to Ukraine, so the level of reduction is, is, is smaller. But the gains for Ukraine are much greater than for the EU. You only have to look at the size of the different markets. Um, the EU represents between 25%, 30% of, EU's ex uh, of, of Ukraine's current exports. So the potential there is enormous. For the EU, Ukraine only represents less than 2% of ex external trade. So although there is potential there for the EU, it's clearly much more important. The agreement is much more important in this sense for Ukraine. Now, that's the classical part of a free trade area, but we talk about a deep and comprehensive free trade area. And why is that? Well, uh, we call it deep because the level of integration between Ukraine and the EU is quite far-reaching. By implementing the DCFTA, Ukraine will go much beyond tariff reductions. It commits itself to align its regulations with almost the whole body of EU laws and standards that we call the ACI. And the DCFTA is comprehensive. Why? Because it covers all sectors of the economy. Industrial goods, agricultural products, consumer goods and services. Now compared to other agreements that the EU has signed with uh, other third countries, such as a recent one with South Korea, agreements with North African countries. Uh, indeed, we have two big negotiations underway at the moment, 
between the EU and the United States and between the EU and Japan. But in all of those cases, they are more limited than the agreement that has been reached with, with Ukraine, because this one covers a much wider range of subjects and requires a much deeper alignment of regulations. The only equivalent ones are the uh, agreements with Moldova and Georgia, which have been based on the Ukrainian model. Let me have, talk a little bit about industrial goods now, because I focused maybe too much on agriculture. Um, one of the significant elements of the DCFTA is um, a, an agreement to align on industrial standards and regulations. <clears throat> Because one of the most important problems that uh, Ukrainian and European exporters face on a day-to-day -day basis is the problem of different technical norms and standards, which makes cross-border trading much more difficult. The DCFTA foresees widespread alignment between Ukrainian and European standards, both for industrial goods and also agricultural products. And over time, this alignment is going to reduce cost for companies that currently have to comply with two different sets of norms and regulations and apply for different certificates. For example, um, when we started the negotiations on the DCFTA, we looked at the costs that Ukrainian companies uh, faced wanting, who are wanting to export to the EU. And we calculated that they face additional production costs of around about 14-15% on average in order to meet EU standards. Now, of course, if Ukraine and the EU were to use the same standards, those additional costs would disappear. Um, and, and there are a whole series of indirect positive effects for Ukrainian producers as the new regulations would provide incentives for businesses to modernize, improve their production processes, invest in new technologies, become more competitive globally. Because um, not only Ukrainian consumers would benefit because products placed on the Ukrainian market would be made according to more modern international standards but also those companies that adapt to these standards will find that they can sell their products not only within the EU, but also to the rest of the world. Um, there's very much often a focus in Ukraine on the EU market and the, and the Russian market, or the CIS market. Um, but of course, um, a very significant market and a growing market for Ukraine is the rest of the world, the Middle East, Turkey, Far East, Africa, uh, and um, if companies adapt to more modern standards, they will be able to sell their products more easily internationally to those markets as well. But it's not just about the EU. It's, it's about positioning Ukraine in a place where it can uh, compete globally. And now I come to the question of costs, because this has been discussed quite often recently. I've, I've seen different figures of costs uh, saying that the conversion costs for Ukraine or Ukrainian businesses to European standards are anything like 100 billion US dollars, 500 billion US dollars. Um, to be honest, we've not seen any of the studies. Um, but I would make three points in relation to costs. Firstly, what would be the costs of not modernizing? What would be the costs of simply stagnating and not making change changes to the situation today? Secondly, Costs can be considered to be investments. As I said, if you invest in modernizing, if you look at successful companies around the world, they have invested. It's cost them money to get to a position where they can, can compete globally. Um, investors, foreign investors, would be much more likely to, uh, to help with those costs, to invent, invest in Ukrainian companies as joint ventures if they could see that there was a, a perspective for economic reform in the future. And of course, the costs are not necessarily costs to Ukrainian businesses. The costs can be met by, uh, by, by, by government assistance, uh, by assistance from international financial institutions, from the EU also, and indeed um, by investors, both domestic and foreign, putting money into businesses. So this discussion about costs, I would say that um, if, if, if you look at successful economies like Germany, Germany over the last 10 years has invested um, 5,400 billion US dollars into its uh, industry. In comparison, Ukraine has invested only 250 billion. It's an enormous difference, but you can see the difference in the global competitiveness. These are not costs, these are investments. 
And then finally, I wanted to say a word about um, the technical, re while I'm talking about technical regulations, about the technical regulations and standards of the customs union. Because there has also been a lot of discussion about um, alignment between um, customs union standards and Ukrainian standards. There's nothing in the DCFTA uh, which will prevent a Ukrainian producer continuing to trade with Russian customers as well as European customers as well as customers elsewhere in the world. That is what happens today and, and, and nothing will change that. Um, so if different standards are demanded in the customs union, just like today, that Ukrainian producer can organize different production runs to meet the different standards of different export markets. The only thing that the DCFTA would change is that the normal production for the domestic market for Ukrainian producers, uh, for Ukrainian consumers, would become the same as for exports to the EU, which would reduce costs for those products and result in better quality products for, for Ukrainians. And even the customs union is modernizing its system of technical regulations and standards. And guess what? They're using the EU system as their model. So we would hope that over time, over a longer period of time, all of these systems would merge into uh, a, a, a parallel single system, or a single system, although of course that will take some period of time. Now let me say a few words about um, animal products, uh, export of animals, plants, plant, product, plant uh, products, um, which are very, very important for, for Ukraine. Because in parallel to commitments on uh, uh, what we call technical barriers to trade that I've just been talking about. Ukraine has also committed itself in the DCFTA to align with EU legislation and standards on animal health, food safety, plant health measures. Um, and in this area, a, a special cooperation mechanism is foreseen to monitor progress and to make recommendations on changes to Ukraine's legislation in this field. Uh, there are a whole series of trade facilitation measures that are foreseen relating to uh, verification procedures, listing of establishments that have met certain standards and so on. Um, this is a fairly technical area, but it's an extremely important area on which the Ukrainian government will need to move as quickly as possible in order to get the benefits of the tariff reductions that I've discussed. Um, we've seen the Ministry of Agriculture has already got plans uh, and uh, the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade to push forward in this area of food safety because it's very, very important um, not only to um, um, uh, get access to the European market by lower tariffs, but also to be able to meet the, 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 the various food safety standards. Another big area which is hardly ever discussed in this country is services. Um, in the field of services, the DCFTA is again unprecedented in the extent of its liberalization. The services chapter of the DCFTA is actually based on the um, services part of the association agreements that were concluded with countries that have eventually acceded to the EU. So, um, for example, Croatia, that recently joined the EU, uh, uh, had uh, almost similar obligations as those that are set out in this, uh, this agreement. So what it means is that once it is implemented, it would provide Ukraine with a possibility for complete what's called freedom of establishment in all services and non-services sectors, meaning that Ukrainian service businesses would be able to set up shop in the EU uh, and, and, and vice versa. Ukrainian and EU service providers therefore would be able to run businesses in each other's territories and be treated in the same way as domestic service providers. And in certain areas, the DCFTA foresees legislative al alignment. This relates to financial services, telecom services, postal courier services, and maritime services. Um, once Ukraine has taken over the appropriate European legislation, it means that the EU internal market will be opened up to Ukrainian companies in those sectors. Uh, in our assessment, we think this is, could be particularly positive for Ukraine in the postal, distribution, and communication sectors, where Ukraine has a number of advantages, but of course it would give opportunities to Ukrainian service companies to expand businesses like they've never been able to before. And there, there are a whole series of other areas in the DCFTA that I'd like to mention briefly. Capital movement. There are provisions uh, on freeing up capital movement which would help to enhance economic growth by allowing easier access 
to capital for small businesses in particular and better allocation of capital to more productive uses. Um, the financial sector in Ukraine should benefit most from this. Public procurement. The DCFTA foresees that there would be gradual alignment of Ukraine's legislation on public procurement with that of the, uh, the European Union. With the sole exception of the defence sector, and, it, and all public procurement rules around the world exclude the defence sector, this is normal. But other than that, we would allow mutual unrestricted access of European and um, Ukrainian suppliers and service providers to each other's public procurement markets. So if the Ukrainian government uh, wants to um, uh, buy pens from somewhere, chairs, um, cars, um, the, the public procurement at the moment in this country is fairly restricted. It means that, that there are only limited opportunities for businesses by opening that up and also by allowing Ukrainian businesses access to similar public procurement markets with, across the EU. There are, there are huge potentials for new opportunities and, and, and potential for businesses here. Competition policy is a very important area uh, that needs improvement in Ukraine in order to um, um, encourage businesses and investors to, uh, to grow. Um, we think it's an area that should see major improvements if the DCFTA is fully implemented. Ukraine has agreed to progressively align its, legis its legislation with that of the European Union in a number of areas, including state aid, state subsidies to businesses, and transparency of decision making. Now, effective enforcement and establishment of a properly equipped competition authority are key aspects of that agreement. For example, competition law, European style competition law, would apply to state controlled enterprises. Ukraine is committed to introducing a system of state aid controls that's similar to that of the EU, uh, particularly uh, to avoid subsidies that distort trade uh, and um, to establish a mechanism for sharing information on subsidies. Now, these are all fairly technical issues, but it, it, it's about ensuring a level playing field for businesses to, to operate on. Intellectual property rights. There are some very detailed provisions in the DCFTA regarding this, including a very strong section on enforcement of legislation based on EU rules, uh, and also some detailed provisions on so-called geographical indications. These are uh, products like, uh, shall I say, champagne, uh, which um, have uh, a particular uh, um, uh, restricted use uh, in terms of uh, indicating products. Um, Ukraine uh, would be able to um, also uh, uh, develop some of its own geographical indications for certain products that are produced here to, to stop others from using those names. Current European legislation on intellectual property rights is more advanced than Ukraine's because it it is uh, better adapted to the digital field. Um, it covers electronic commerce via the internet, for example, where internet piracy is a major issue here. Uh, whereas Ukraine's legislation is very much focused on physical trade, uh, counterfeit copies of CDs, clothes, etc. So through the DCFTA, we hope that Ukraine will be able to bring its legislation more up to date. Customs. We already have fairly good cooperation between the EU and Ukraine on customs, but the DCFTA would enhance this by establishing a framework for mutual administrative assistance to ensure the correct application of customs legislation, cooperation on customs irregularities and fraud. Also in the DCFTA, there are a few trade-related energy provisions which relate to the pricing of energy goods, um, uh, to prohibit dual pricing. Um, there are some obligations on transport and transit of energy, which carry forward commitments in the Energy Charter Treaty. Although, and I know energy is a major issue uh, for this country, there are not massive changes in this area in, in terms of the DCFTA. It's more about um, um, Ukraine implementing commitments under the Energy Charter Treaty. <clears throat> and then, um, finally, in running through the elements of the DCFTA, I should mention that the uh, agreement contains its own dispute settlement mechanism. Um, if there is disagreement between the two sides on how or whether something has been properly implemented. Now, this dispute settlement mechanism is based on that of the World Trade Organization, but it's a faster one. It, it, it foresees agreements in, in a shorter time, and of course it would be bilateral rather than multilateral. 
And then in addition, there is something new uh, which is uh, referred to as a mediation mechanism. Now, this allows the two parties to try to resolve some specific market access problems quickly and effectively without the need to go to a full dispute settlement. Now, <clears throat> the EU is preparing an uh, extensive program of financial support for Ukraine to assist the implementation process. Uh, my colleague, um, Holger Roman, uh, will be here this afternoon to go in more detail uh, about that. Um, but I just throw one figure uh, in at this point. We're looking at around about 180 to 200 million euros um, on a yearly basis <coughs> to be uh, committed to assist the implementation process, both in terms of budget support and technical assistance. Now, I should say that uh, this support is um, assistance for Ukraine to take forward the legislative uh, uh, support, uh, the, the, the legislative uh, changes that are necessary. <clears throat> the EU is quite happy to uh, assist Ukraine in terms of economic reform. Here we're prepared to put in money. Where we are not prepared to put in money is to help Ukraine pay its debts. And sometimes there is a confusion of these things in, in the media. So um, that's the DCFTA in a nutshell. Um, maybe I'll just say a few words about how and when it can be expected to come into force. I'm going to assume for this purpose that the agreement will be signed at the end of next week. Now, following signature, both parties have to ratify the agreement before it enters into force. Um, in fact, the association agreement, according to the agreement itself, will only enter into force two months after the instruments of ratification have been deposited with the Council of the European Union. Now, on the, Euro on the Ukrainian side, this should, in theory, be quite straightforward. The Vakotna Rada will have to give its consent, uh, and uh, that is it. On the European side, it's much more complicated due to the nature of the European Union and its institutions. Ratification of any international agreement has to be done by 28 member state parliaments plus the European Parliament, 29 separate decisions. So even in the best of circumstances, this can take quite a long time, and the process can be held up for unconnected internal political reasons, elections, for example, in different countries. So as it's in both parties' interest to implement the association agreement as soon as possible, the EU side is proposing to follow a procedure that we call provisional application. Um, this means full application of parts of the association agreement while the ratification procedure is still underway. An agreement has been reached between the EU member states that almost all of the DCFTA, and I mean 99% of it, 99% of the DCFTA can be applied provisionally um, on the consent of the European Parliament alone. Now, uh, we, this can happen quite quickly, and in fact will have to happen quite quickly, because the European Parliament will stop its work by the middle of April next year for its elections. But in theory, we could imagine provisional application of the DCFDA from the spring of 2014. I'm, I'm not going to predict a particular date, but uh, 1st of March, 1st of April, something like that is possible. Now, let me stress, this means that all of the tariff reductions, all of the other aspects of the association agreement, which would apply on day one, could start in around about six to nine months' time. The clock would then start ticking for the further commitments, the legislative changes, the other tariff reductions, etc., etc. To finish my the formal part of this presentation today, um, I then just wanted to sum up a, a few final words on uh, the impact of the DCFTA on Ukraine. I've gone into some detail, but this is a more general thought. Um, the model that's foreseen in the DCFTA is not an experimental one. It's one that's been tried and tested before with great success. It's resulted in the transformation of the economies of Central and Eastern Europe. In 1990, Polish GDP per capita was only 8% higher than Ukraine's. Two countries were at, at a similar economic level. Only five years later, Polish GDP was 178% higher than Ukraine's. Today, it's 228% higher. In 1990, Ukrainian exports per capita were identical to those of Poland and 50% above those of Romania. 
By 1995, five years later, Ukrainian exports had fallen to only two times smaller than those of Ukraine, and they were identical to those of Romania. Between 1990 and 1995, total foreign investment into Ukraine fell by 42%. In Poland, it rose by 64%. From 1990 to 2010, investment per capita was two times higher in Bulgaria and nine times higher in Slovenia than in Ukraine. Now, why is this? Well, in the early 1990s, the countries of Central and Eastern European, uh, the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, all signed free trade agreements with the EU, as it was then, and they began to transform their economies. It's not the signature, it's the, it's the, trans, the transformation that they started to take, the, the actions that I've just described. Now, some people would say, ah, yes, but those countries had an accession perspective. They, they were expecting to join, but they, they, this was not the case in the early days. Accession to the EU only became a prospect for the so-called EU10 from about 1994 onwards. If you look at the... The, the, the statistics, you will see that the economic transformation was already underway before the accession became possible. I think this is analogous to the situation with Ukraine today. There's no reason why Ukraine cannot follow the example of these countries and reap the same benefits. But those benefits are only going to come if some hard decisions and actions are taken. The business climate is only going to improve. The investors will only come to Ukraine if the government does actually take the necessary steps to introduce economic reforms in line with the commitments that are set out in the association agreement. Businesses will only get the benefits if they themselves invest, modernize, upgrade, transform themselves in order to become competitive. Now, the EU, as I've said, is ready to help this process. We've got wide experience in such economic transformations from the last 20 years or more. Uh, we have the technical know-how. Our businesses are ready to invest. Uh, we have some targeted product, uh, projects and assistance. But ultimately, this is a question for Ukraine. It's not going to be a quick fix. It took 10 years or more for these countries to, to improve their situation. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, uh, nobody on the European side is promising uh, magic solutions. But Ukraine does have to decide what kind of economy it wants to have in the future. If it wants to modernize, if it wants to create opportunities for economic growth, then it needs a strategy. And one is on offer. It's on the table now for signature. It's called the Association Agreement, including a deep and comprehensive free trade area. So I think I've taken up 30, 35 minutes or so of your time. And I'm now happy to answer questions uh, as well as I'm able to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. So I'll pass the floor to you. Questions? Ideas? Um, hello, my name is Natalia and my question is um, about the cash and electronic money. If I know the Europe country, especially I know mean, uh, Sweden, like take like example, but I also sure that in other European co uh, countries is the same. They try to use maximum electronic mon uh, uh, money. Um, now it's very hard to pay cash, uh, especially in deals. In Ukraine, still, especially in the small business, you can pay cash, even if it's more popular than electronic mon uh, uh, money. Uh, is it some policy? Uh, that control this, uh, will be changed this in the future, or it uh, should decide the uh, country inside? Thank you. Uh, on this particular question, there, there is not any requirement uh, to, 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 to move in this direction. But of course, um, a number of countries have chosen to, to encourage more um, electronic money transfers and, and, and using modern technologies. Um, uh, it, it, it's an obvious way forward. It offers more flexibility for for, for citizens and and for businesses to uh, to operate. So there are no requirements for, uh, for example, Ukraine uh, or indeed uh, within the EU for EU countries to to take this up. But um, voluntarily, countries are moving in this direction um, to make the most of new technologies. And um, I, I'm sure that um, a, a, a lot of people in the financial services in Ukraine would like to move in this direction also.
Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for really informative um, discussion for lecture, your and my question actually it relates to the um, to the to the like um, to the question of the geographical indicators. As you said, that Ukraine will have an opportunity to uh, develop its own geographical indicators for products. But on the other hand, we know that rebranding of products is a costly uh, process. So I know that. It's, Ukraine is not unique in doing so because many, uh, like, m I think most of the EU countries have gone through this process. So could you name just an example or two of countries that actually overcome this problem and they, they have become successful um, when introducing new products? Thank you. I, I, I think there are a couple of different aspects. Um, um, in the EU, the geographical indicators are looked at as a means of promoting a product. So um, uh, what's interesting uh, is that, um, for example, uh, I know that the very last issue that was uh, agreed in the recent um, negotiations between the EU and Canada, we, we, we just uh, agreed a free trade agreement with Canada, the very last issue to be agreed was Greek feta cheese. Um, because the Canadians produced cheese that they called feta and we wanted to have something in the agreement that said no, if you're going to sell feta cheese in, uh, in, in Canada, it must come from Greece because this is how we recognize it here. You can call, you can say Canadian feta style or something like this. But th So this was a very important thing and it's important because that is a, 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 um, a, a positive way of marketing that product for Greece. Um, there would be opportunities for Ukraine to do the same thing. You have excellent products here, excellent uh, uh, agricultural products. For example, this is mainly in the agricultural area, uh, wines and uh, and, and so on. Um, uh, we have experience in being able to show how you can develop that, and so you can use it as a as a, as a marketing promotion tool. I would say rather than uh, rather than seeing it as a cost. On the other hand, there are currently some. Ukrainian products, which are known as uh, port wine, uh, Madeira, uh, Champansky, etc., and, and, and these, under the agreement, would have to be renamed, um, and that, I guess, is is this is the cost that you're you're thinking about. Um, uh, uh, yes, I suppose that there would be costs, of course, for doing that. But as I said earlier on, I mean, you can you can look at um, also um, marketing it as a, as a different type of product. Um, but I would look at the opportunities there too. Hey, Ms. Oksana, and I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think that uh, finding of association agreement will solve all the problems that foreign investors face in Ukraine, especially like bureaucracy and giving licenses? If all of the commitments in the agreement are implemented, then it will do wonders for the business climate. I mean, the business climate here is, is pretty poor. Um, I regularly see uh, European investors, but also members of the European Business Association that are Ukrainian businesses. And um, the problems that European or Ukrainian businesses face here are not different. They are the same. There are pressures from the tax authorities. There are uh, the, the, the bureaucratic problems, um, licensing issues, uh, corruption, uh, which um, uh, makes doing business here difficult and puts off investment. Um, these things can't be solved overnight. As I said, this is a long-term process. But um, one thing would be that if, if the government showed commitment to, to implementing these, these changes, then it would offer businesses uh, certainly more stability. They would know that um, in a few years' time, things were going to change. And what business is like is some predictability and some, some stability. And uh, at the moment in Ukraine, the legislative environment is very unpredictable. Um, uh, if you look at the number of tax changes that take place during each year, it's enormous. It's difficult for businesses to cope. Um, they, 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 they need some predictability because they're planning their investments over a longer time period. So 
the short answer to your question is yes, I, I would hope, I, I think it should improve the business climate. And this certainly is what a number of investors are waiting for. Um, I, I've, I've heard that um, um, a lot of European businesses have been holding back on investing in Ukraine to wait and see what's going to happen at Vilnius. Because, uh, I mean, I said right at the beginning, the signature is not going to change anything, but actually the signature will make a change because it will show the direction that Ukraine is going to head in. And uh, that will encourage businesses to say, OK, then the, the climate is difficult now, but in five years, ten years' time, I can imagine things would be better. So I'm prepared to put in an investment now and, and see my business grow during that period. If there is no signature, uh, if the situation remains very unclear, those investments will not come. And if you are talking about investments, I want to ask uh, what spheres of economic in Ukraine are most the most attractive for European investors and what can we, I know, expect from them and maybe, yes, maybe it's agriculture or more industrial, maybe some sphere. What do you think? To, to be honest, I think all spheres here are potentially of interest. Um, cl clearly, there are certain areas where, where um, because of the structure of the economy, Ukraine has strengths. Um, agriculture is an obvious one. Um, uh, productivity in agriculture here could be, um, uh, could be improved uh, quite considerably. Um, uh, land reform issues here would, would, would help. Um, but also, um, there is a lot of... Um, there are a lot of highly trained people here with specialist knowledge. Let's say in the machine building area, uh, you have um, uh, facilities for aircraft uh, uh, construction, um, etc. Right across the board, there are possibilities and potential here for, for, for investments. And then in the services side, I think already there have been quite a few investments in, let's say, the retail sector here. But um, there, there is a lot of potential. Uh, yesterday, somebody mentioned um, the IT sector there, I think, again, um, um, because one of the resources, you have a number of resources here uh, which are attractive to investors. Um, there are the physical resources, uh, the black earth, uh, if you like, um, the agricultural potential. Uh, you have the, um, um, the human resources here, the highly trained uh, uh, workforce experience. Um, then the physical resources of, of, of factories and plants that are in place that probably need quite a bit of modernizing, but, but right across the board, uh, industrial agricultural service, I think there is potential here. Hello, my name is Sophia. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very informative and detailed lecture. Well, it, quite, it answered a lot of my questions. But speaking of intel intellectual property, um, as you have said, um, there, uh, there is a need for some improvements uh, in this area, and uh, uh, what I'm interested in, uh, what do you think? Uh, well, we have some legislation here, and it is not that bad, but will we need other legislation, or do we just need to work on the enforcement on, of, of, of the legislation we have right now? Thank you. Uh that's an excellent question because uh, you're, you're right. The legislation that's in place at the moment is actually pretty good. Um, it's the enforcement that's the problem. It's, it's the, um, um, particularly the court system, which is a more general problem, not just with intellectual property rights, but here it is a particular problem. Um, where there are abuses of intellectual property rights, where there are people um, producing goods that are counterfeit, um, ignoring patent re regulations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is not much capacity on the government side to be able to deal with that, and the courts don't seem to be particularly interested in these cases. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little example, um, just an anecdote. Uh, somebody that uh, I, I was once speaking to here some time ago who said, uh, and I had been complaining that there were uh, not sufficient numbers of small businesses here because for the size of the country the, the number of small businesses here uh, is actually very low 
And there are various reasons for that. And I was saying, you know, there needs to be more entrepreneurial spirit. There needs to be more people prepared to take a risk of setting up businesses because that's where a lot of economic growth will come from. And um, then this person said to me, yes, but at the same time, you've been criticizing us for um, intellectual property right um, abuses. And he said to me, if I go down to the market and I see all of these CDs or DVDs that are on sale, um, they, th this is entrepreneurial spirit. Somebody has got a hold of these products and is making good money from this. And I said, yes, but they're breaking the law. No, but they're entrepreneurs. This is good. And um, I, I, I use that anecdote just to um, illustrate the fact that maybe the courts here and indeed um, some elements of government here don't uh, take intellectual property rights as being serious as being real um, issues, but, but it's so important uh, for, for any country to be able to protect the, um, um, the innovations and the ideas that are coming from its own citizens. Um, um, so, so that people here who um, have a new idea about setting up, whether it's, it's developing a new computer game at one end or even finding a new way to improve the efficiency of uh, fuel use in cars, I, I, I don't know. A lot of clever people around who, who uh, would, would, would not take forward those ideas in this country if they felt that those ideas can be taken from them and that their uh, time and efforts that they put into that is going to be stolen by others. Pharmaceutical sector, for example, medicines. Um, there are some generic producers in this country who produce medicines uh, that, uh, that anyone can produce, um, but there isn't very much research and development facility. Um, research and development is, 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 it tends to be done elsewhere. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean to say there are not people here who could do research and development. Um, but uh, uh, if you spend 10 years developing a new medicine and then you find it's not sufficiently protected by a patent and that anyone can then produce it and your, your time and efforts and money have been wasted, then, then clearly you, you're, you're not going to do that development in this country. You're going to do it somewhere else. And so intellectual property rights, I think, are very, very important for encouraging the development of businesses here and for uh, they have a huge contribution to, to any economy. It's enforcement, you're right, that's the problem. My name is Elena, and I want also to ask you about intellectual property rights. As I know that in the EU situation is also not very, how to say, straight. Uh, for example, there is a big discussion about act agreement, and there is a big discussion between the balance of uh, right for privacy, human right for privacy, for information, and intellectual property rights on the other side. So do you think that we can have also the same problem in Ukraine, uh, between the balance of these two rights, and which of these rights has the priority. Thank you. That's true. I, I think that there are um, global discussions going on on, uh, on, on on these sorts of issues. And as you're right, the ACTA was negotiated and then rejected by, uh, by the European Parliament, uh, which was a, a difficult situation. Um, there are different views on this. Um, if, if you look at one of the, 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 the big topical issues at the moment, internet piracy, um, it, it, it's seen by, by some people as um, you know, illegal downloading of films, music, etc. Um, it's something that very, very many people have done um, without considering it to be a crime. Um, but on the other hand, um, from the viewpoint of the, the, uh, the creators of that uh, art, music, whatever, um, who um, would expect to get royalties for what they've, they've, they've produced. Um, normally, those people have not produced that art, music, whatever, for, for, for monetary reward, but it is part of, 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 of what motivates the whole, uh, the whole system. So th there are certainly debates un un underway. But there is also legislation in place. And of course, at the end of the day, I'm a bureaucrat. And so I, I, I look at uh, enforcing legislation. And, and it, if the legislation of a country says that um, uh, it is illegal to do certain things, then, it, then, then that illegality ought to be followed up by, um, uh, by, by the necessary measures. But uh, you're, you're right. And I think this, this debate is going to go on. The internet has changed so many things. 
and it certainly changed uh, thoughts about uh, property and so on. But um, uh, intellectual property rights, as I said, goes right across from um, um, all, all sorts of physical and and uh, um, uh, electronic products. So uh, it's it's uh, the, the situation can be different in different different places. Um, in in some areas, um, counterfeit products can actually be um, um, actually dangerous for health. I mean, if you look at counterfeit medicines again, um, generic medicines is one thing, um, but um, uh, if you buy a product and you think it's uh, going to solve your headache and actually it causes some other, something else because it's been made in a, in a the, 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 uh, counterfeit false toys, for example. We had a, a number of problems in, in the EU with um, toys coming in from... Um, um, from uh, illegally from uh, from China usually, uh, which uh, are supposed to be genuine articles and are found to be dangerous for children. So th there are a whole series of issues around intellectual property rights and different sides of, uh, sides of the argument. But um, certainly from the EU perspective, a lot of our current uh, export value and wealth is in the area of um, the added design and um, um, Innovations that um, European producers have um, have, uh, uh, have 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 contributed, whether it's uh, the, a new design for a for a, for, a, for a suit or whether it's, um, uh, as I said, a new computer game, uh, it doesn't really matter. But so somebody has uh, somebody who has spent time developing that and has used their skills does, in my view, deserve to have uh, some uh, recompense for that, and so. There needs to be a balance in the legislation between uh, 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 allowing those people to, those creative people, to get back uh, something for what they have done, to encourage them to do more, um, but also obviously not restricting personal freedoms and rights and so on. It, it's a difficult one, and it will continue this discussion. Sirhi. And uh, a lot of Ukrainian e experts uh, said that uh, um, Ukrainian business will need to uh, raise uh, uh, some uh, extra money uh, uh, to, in order to improve its uh, technology uh, uh, and so on, in order to meet uh, European standards. And actually you uh, mentioned uh, the same in your speech. And also you mentioned uh, that it would be easier uh, for Ukraine to for, for Ukrainian government and for Ukrainian business uh, to to borrow money abroad after the agreement will be signed. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I would like to ask: uh, Will uh, the signed agreement uh, have a positive influence on Ukrainian uh, on interest rate within Ukraine? Uh, because it's not a secret that. Uh, 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 interest rate which banks uh, offer to f for Ukrainian uh, businesses is is high. Yeah, actually, it's my question. Thanks. Um, I think, as I said, in, in investments um, for Ukrainian businesses can come from different sources. So certainly, um, uh, I, I think, as as I, as I said, and as you've recognised. Um, uh, as a result of the implementation of the DCFTA, it would encourage, I think, more foreign businesses, not just from the EU, but from, from across the world, to come to Ukraine and invest in, Europe, in, in Ukrainian businesses. Um, there are all sorts of different joint ventures that can be imagined and so on. Um, likewise, um, I would hope that more domestic uh, money is put into Ukrainian businesses. And I don't mean from government. Um, at the moment, the government is in a difficult situation. It doesn't have very much money. But there are some big investors, potential investors in this country who could be putting money into businesses here rather than maybe using it for other purposes or, or taking it offshore. Um, and the EU and, and other uh, international um, financial uh, institutions, the EBRD, uh, the World Bank, um, USAID, all, all these sorts of institutions would be more likely, I think, to, to, to look for investments. In relation to, your, to, to, to the interest rates, um, 
It's, it's, it's a more difficult question because there are so many different factors that affect interest rates and the behavior of banks and, uh, and so on. Um, and I think that uh, if, if you look at it in a different way and you look at the difficulties that Ukraine has at the moment, uh, its whole macroeconomic situation, which is shaky, um, Ukraine clearly needs some um, additional help uh, uh, in order to deal with the next, uh, the coming months. Um, the obvious uh, additional help would be from um, the um, International Monetary Fund, from IMF, um, if Ukraine is prepared to accept the conditions that the IMF would pose. These issues are not directly connected to the association agreement. Um, the The, the, the negotiations with the IMF um, would be necessary whether or not there is a signature, whether or not there would be an association agreement. Um, the only link, I think, is that um, if the association agreement is signed and some of the reforms start to be made, it would put Ukraine in a better position to negotiate a better deal with the IMF. But I think that um, uh, these, these are unrelated and... Um, it's, it's the overall macroeconomic situation that ultimately is going to determine the way that um, banks take decisions on interest rates. Oh. Thank you, Nicholas. My question about, uh, is about trade. So, as you may know, uh, there is a huge disbalance between prices for some products in Ukraine and in EU. I have two examples. First, it's uh, cigarettes and alcohol in Ukraine is much more cheaper than in EU. For example, in Lviv, I can buy one bottle of vodka for three euro, but in Belgium it costs 15 euro. So does the single market mean that I can produce vodka to Belgium for Ukrainian price? And uh, the same situation uh, with cars. Uh, cars in EU uh, is much more cheaper than in Ukraine. And uh, does it mean that uh, this Ukraine or these cars will be uh, sell in Ukraine for cheaper uh, European price? I can give you another example. I'm 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 British, and so one of the shops that I know very well in the UK is Marks and Spencers. And Marks and Spencers is here also in Ukraine. Uh, exactly the same product, uh, products, exactly the same clothes here are two to three times more expensive here in Ukraine. Um, there are a number of different factors. Um, uh, one issue is uh, um, in, in terms of Ukraine selling its goods into Europe. One issue, uh, when you're talking about alcoholic products, uh, uh, you have excise duties. And so the excise duties, so um, additional taxes that the tax office puts on alcoholic uh, products, tobacco products, uh, are, are generally much higher in the EU than they are here. And that's why, uh, so when you buy your bottle of vodka in, in, uh, in Brussels, it costs you more because uh, you have to pay more to the tax office in, in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, plus there are maybe some other costs built in uh, in, in, in the retail system. Uh, here, the, the, the costs are less. Um, uh, with cars, of course, there's no excise duty on cars. Um, the car production costs have other factors, uh, labor costs, for example, um, uh, and so on. And so it, it, it could be possible for Ukrainian cars to be produced at a, at a lower cost. Um, you know, the, the energy prices here are generally less for businesses. So the overall costs uh, that a business would have to pay in order to produce a car here uh, are likely to be much less than they would be uh, in the EU, although there are differences across the EU as well, of course. Um, a, a lot of cars are produced now in uh, Slovakia uh, because their costs are lower than in, in other parts of, of, of the EU. Uh, there are different social costs for, for, for workers and so on. Um, so it's, it's a matter of looking, depending on the product, on different benefits. The reason why I think certain products here are more expensive than uh, they are in the EU relates uh, firstly to uh, higher customs duties. So obviously if they come down then, then, but also I have to be perfectly honest, to um, corruption in the supply chain. Um, 
by the time the good crosses the border and gets to the shop, there are, are lots of different people who can take a little bit of money, and that puts the price up in the shops. So those those sorts of things um, also have to be tackled, um, and uh, can be if there is more transparency in the whole system. And it's like a, a quite complicated process of implementing it in Ukraine and all this business climate that you want to see in Ukraine, yes. And uh, don't you think that Ukraine, I don't know, it's quite complicated for me, but um, if Ukraine want to lose everything that it has from independence or and want it break its economics, implemented it? This didn't happen with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, however, uh, as I said, the, the, the current economic situation in Ukraine is really quite poor. So uh, the, 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 the timing of the implementation of the DCFTA may be problematic. Um, but as I said, the two things, in a sense, are unconnected. Um, um, we... The EU is strongly, strongly in favour of Ukraine reaching a deal with the IMF in order to stabilise its macroeconomic situation, which would put it in a better position to be able to deal with uh, economic reforms. Um, but all of these decisions have to be... We're not a party to those agreements. It's a bilateral discussion between the IMF and, uh, and, uh, and Ukraine. Um, there are also ways of targeting assistance. Um, it would be important, I think, during this whole transformating, uh, transformative process that um, the Ukrainian government works well with all the different international donors that I've mentioned, the World Bank, uh, EBRD and so on, to make sure that uh, the more sensitive areas uh, receive the most help. Um, I mean areas of the economy. Um, I, I would take, for example, um, um, the machine building sector, where I think that um, there is potential, but uh, uh, there probably um, a, quite a lot of money needs to be put into the modernization. That would be an area that therefore I would think should be targeted for, for a certain amount of assistance. Um, um, but, you know, in other areas, there will be compensatory gains. So it's, it will be a matter really of, of, of monitoring the process and um, using the assistance and making sure that money goes to those who need it. So, Nicholas, thank you very much for answering and for lecturing. My question is concern, concerns Russia because I mean we are we are now in in talk um, in a, in a very hard talk with Russia, right? But what I would think that probably what can be a solution is that if if the EU signs an FTA deal with Russia, so that this this whole idea of you know customs union protecting against the EU etc is the EU going to push forward for this idea because EU is now negotiating with the US I guess this is much more complicated to get the free trade area with the US than with Russia what is your opinion uh, I have a fairly simple answer the EU would like to do such a thing but Russia does not want it Russia has said uh, it would refuse to negotiate with the EU only in the format of the customs union which would mean that they would only consider negotiations on a free trade agreement with uh, the three countries of the customs union currently. That's not a problem with Russia because they're a member of the WTO. It's not a problem with uh, Kazakhstan because they're likely to join WTO. It would be a major problem with Belarus. Um, it, it's not possible for a WTO member to have a free trade agreement with a non-WTO member not certainly of the extent of a, of, a, of a full modern free trade agreement. You can have things on paper which mean very little, and there are such agreements around the world. So uh, the problem is that um, 
you're, you're right, that would be a longer term solution. Um, but Russia is insisting on something that we cannot do. Is um, basically when 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 there was an information when uh, Russia also um, made this attack on Moldovan wine, and then there was a statement from the EU like saying that it will uh, facilitate the exports of Moldovan wine, and then Ukraine was asking the same basically, and there was not so much clear reaction from the EU saying like. Oh, we are we're going to promote your products in the EU, etc. I think that Angela Merkel said only a few days ago there was reports in the media as if the EU is thinking about that. And my question is, what what would will it mean in detail? So, is there any mechanism to promote uh, Ukrainian production? Probably, maybe beyond association agreement. Uh, is there any such thing the EU is reflecting upon? What the EU is reflecting upon is um, how it can assist Ukraine if Russia takes uh, punitive action against Ukraine following the signature. Uh, let's be quite honest about this. Um, although there is nothing in the association agreement which in itself would make any changes at all to the trade relationship between Ukraine and Russia, Russia has been making all sorts of threats. Uh, Russia has been making similar threats to Moldova uh, and uh, so uh, in the case of Moldova it was seen to be appropriate that uh, the EU would offer some special arrangements for Moldovan wine which is one of their most important exports. The um, situation with Ukraine is different because you have such a wide range of different exports but we are looking at uh, creative ways of um, being able to assist. To be honest I, I, I think the um, the best way in which we can assist is to open up our markets as quickly as possible. Um, in other words, to get a quick provisional application, because as I've said already, there is a, a, an asymmetrical uh, approach, so we are, have already committed to do this. That, that, that would not cause us any legal problems. Very often in the EU, there are, um, we can't react quickly to things because we have to get consent and agreement from so many different bodies. But um, uh, early provisional application, I think, would be good. Um, targeted assistance uh, would be good. Um, maybe some promotion activities, as you say, would be another element. Then my last question, probably. You mentioned that there is an um, there is a symmetry in the opening, but you also said that the uh, EU tariffs are lower than the Ukraine's tariffs. But uh, as far as I know, in agriculture, is vice versa. The EU tariffs are higher. Am I correct? Am I right? And in this case, and in basically Ukraine's accession to WTO was quite um, on, on conditions which are quite open to international economy, right? In which case, in which goods EU has uh, higher tariffs than Ukraine and in which uh, goods EU has lower tariffs? You're roughly right. That's right. Agriculture is, is slightly different, and that's why I, I'm looking actually for some figures that I wanted to give you, which uh, just give you an idea of the asymmetry and uh, and so on. So, if you look at agricultural products, um, uh, the difference is that um, from the very start of the implementation, around about 50% of EU exports into Ukraine, uh, the, the Ukraine would drop its, its tariffs immediately for about 50% of products. Um, the EU would drop its tariffs immediately for around 82% of its products, so that also shows something. Um, the, the other thing that we have done is that we have for a number of, of products some um, uh, quotas. So um, there is a, a, a certain quantity of a product that can be exported to the EU uh, for zero tariff and anything that goes beyond that then pays a higher tariff and uh, very often it's not worth paying that higher tariff because of the, the, the impact on prices. 
Um, now, the, the, the uh, products that we in the EU cover by tariffs that we are going to expand uh, represent around about 20% of the value of current Ukrainian exports. And they, again, would be uh, would in the first couple of years, not immediately, but in the first couple of years, they would they would be expanded. Uh, in comparison, um, uh, where there are tariffs on the Ukrainian side, they only represent about 4% of EU exports. So there, there are some differences. Processed food products, I think, is an interesting one as well, because here, again, Ukraine will grant preferential treatment to around about 50% of its processed food products. The EU will grant immediate preferences for around about 83%. Uh, and then if you look at uh, industrial products, this is, this is more significant as well, uh, where you have, um, with the exception of the automotive sector, where there are some special rules, um, Ukraine is going to grant uh, preferential treatment, so reducing tariffs down to zero, for about 49%, just under 50% of EU exports. Uh, the EU will immediately uh, drop uh, its tariffs for 95% of its industrial products. But, but, but you're right, the agricultural area is the one where um, I think there are, there, are, there are most things to gain, uh, there are most changes, and maybe that's where also we, uh, uh, we, we, we lower our tariffs more. But uh, the agricultural area is not just about tariffs, it's also about these um, changes that need to be made to um, food safety legislation. Um, We've had a big success in the last uh, year or so in relation to to chickens and eggs, to poultry, uh, to, to, to Ukrainian egg producers who can now export into Europe because they have been able to uh, bring their products up to the, the, the European standards. We know that the dairy sector in Ukraine is working very hard on this. There was a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a big delegation of um, uh, Ukrainian dairy producers that went to Brussels uh, to meet with various people to talk to experts about some uh, further changes that need to be made. Uh, it's more difficult in the dairy sector because you have a very large number of small producers, and I mean really small producers, individuals who own a cow, whereas in, 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 in the, uh, the poultry side it's a bit different. But I, I, I can see that they're, they're determined and they're making steps um, to open up that market also. So. Um, there is potential there. I've drifted away from your question, I'm sorry. But that, that's okay, because I have another question on, on dairy sector. In the dairy sector, it's it's true that Ukraine, Ukrainian dairy sector is dominated by the small producers, and it's no machinery production, no automatized industrial production, which is basically the, as far as I understand, requirement for exporting into the EU. And there is a great safety concerns, right? But, okay, we are, we are, we, in the association ag agreement, we'll be transferring to these more mechanic automatized forms of production, according to your standards. But will it influence these small producers who are producing this milk and dairy products in Ukraine? Or will it affect only the Ukrainian exports to the EU? What do you think? It should affect both, because... Um I mean, even if the EU, even if the association agreement was not signed, um, then if uh, uh, the Ukrainian dairy sector, or indeed any other sector, any other producers wanted to, they can still um, uh, work to meet European standards and export. Um, the, 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 the difference will be that um, the domestic production should also be uh, made at uh, European levels. So it, it, it should affect both. Thank you. More questions? Tatiana? Sergio? Okay, great. My name is Ivana, and uh, uh, what is your point of view? What uh, branch of, eco of uh, Ukrainian economy should be innovated first of all, and how it, uh, how it can improve the economical situation of Ukraine? understand the first part of your question. Uh, what, what branch of economy should be innovated first of all? What is the most problematic, uh, problematic uh, branch of economy in Ukraine? I, 
I think it, it, it's difficult to say um, um, be, because it's not necessarily branches. It's it's <clears throat> in individual factories, individual producers. There, 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 there are some companies here that are already uh, um, producing goods that are, are of, of, of such high standard. Um, um, let, let me think, for example, here in Lviv, you have the, uh, the handmade chocolate, um, uh, which, is, which is an incredibly good product. I mean, I, I, I used to live in, uh, in Belgium before I came here, and Belgium is known across the world for uh, its high-quality products, uh, its high-quality chocolates. Uh, here in Lviv, you have something which can compete with that globally. Um, and, 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 and you look at the innovations uh, there, you have, a, a, certainly I, I, in, 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 in Kiev, there are certain branches uh, and uh, I was amazed to see um, chocolate paintings, which I haven't seen anywhere else in the world. Um, you know that you can you can take in a photograph uh, uh, of uh, whatever your your pet, and you can have a, a, a chocolate painting made of it, which I think is a great idea. That's an innovation uh, that is already here in Ukraine, and I and I, I understand that, that that company is already starting to move out into Europe without the association agreement. All these things are possible without. But after Russian ban on Ukrainian chocolate, chocolate became a Ukrainian national idea. <laughs> I, I, I knew you were going to mention Roshan. Roshan is also a good product, I think. Um, and um, they're, of course, able to export already to Europe. There is, in fact, a Roshan factory in Lithuania, uh, which is producing the same. Uh, they're available within the EU. Um, so they um, clearly meet uh, European standards already. Uh, this is possible. That's that's it's not a not a problem. But I mean, we all know that that, that the, the the approach taken by Russia towards that company and indeed to 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 many others is uh, is not necessarily based on standards. It's 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 for other reasons. Uh, Lithuania recently has had uh, the same problems with some of its dairy products uh, exports to to Russia, which were suddenly blocked. Um, A couple of years ago, we had we had uh, the famous vegetable war. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, there were there were some genuine uh, problems with certain uh, vegetables in Germany that led to an outbreak of some some illnesses and people died. So it was quite a serious issue. Um, most countries around the world therefore took certain uh, certain actions. Russia was the only country that decided to ban all EU exports for a period of, of vegetables for a period of about six months. Um, so uh, we, we, we know the problems. But just going back to the question about innovation, um, you know, there, there are, um, um, within each branch of industry here, I think that there are uh, good companies that are already looking forward and innovating, and there are those that are uh, relying on protection to um, just survive. And, um, um, you know, all, all the economies around the world, all the companies around the world, that have become successful have been those that have innovated, that have um, uh, looked at new ways of selling, developing products. Um, uh, look, look at Nokia. Nokia a few years ago was a company that um, you know everyone. I, I used to have a Nokia phone. Uh, now nobody has a Nokia phone because they they forgot they had to innovate. Um, um, this 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 is important for for all businesses to continue in in, in every sector. Thank you. More questions? Anatoly? Sergio? Oksana? Um. Uh, we today talk about benefits and advantages of uh, this agreement. And can you summarize uh, uh, main disadvantages for Ukraine uh, of this agreement? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, Short I think, uh, summarize. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think as I went through the presentation, I went through different advantages for uh, on 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 different areas. Um, in terms of disadvantages, I mean, we're back to the same question, I think, uh, that comes up in different forms. Um, uh, there's, no, there's no gain without pain. Um, you, you, 
you can't win anything. You can't do anything without putting in some efforts. Um, you you can't um, uh, get at a successful economy without making changes. Um, and so uh, the disadvantages, if you if, if you want to to describe them as disadvantages, are that um, some companies and government as well will have to make changes. They'll have to do things in a different way. Some people who are making money out of the current system will no longer be able to under uh, under a more transparent system with with fairer rules. Um, that that I think is the disadvantages for certain people within Ukraine. Um, uh, the the other disadvantages come down, I suppose, to. Um, and again, disadvantage is not the right word. Um, potential problems uh, um, would, would, would come from uh, the way that uh, other third countries may uh, decide to uh, change their approach towards Ukraine. I'm thinking particularly of Russia, of course. Uh, but that's not, a, that's not a disadvantage of the, um, the agreement itself. Um, but um, it, 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 it does seem to be a... Um, uh, an issue which uh, uh, which is which is being considered here. I would I would I would not I, I would not talk about disadvantages. I, I would I would talk about challenges and um, changes that people will have to to face up to. Um, uh, I, I see a lot of businesses here that uh, are simply interested in um, what's known as rent seeking. In other words, uh, they. Uh, they have something, they want to stop other businesses competing with them, uh, they don't want to change, they don't want to innovate, they want to maybe to have a monopoly. Um, that's not good for the country, it's not good for, 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 for you as consumers uh, in terms of prices, um, uh, and so I would hope that more competition um, would, would, would uh, be, be good for Ukraine, but of course it could be bad for those companies and those individuals that um, don't want changes to the current system. Quite well known Poland as well. Let me give you an example from, from Hungary. In the back of the 90s, in the, in the beginning of the 90s, there was a flourishing uh, sunflower pro producing in Hungary. Hungary was uh, producing a lot of sun, sunflower oil. And if you are looking right now at the market, you won't find any sunflower in, in, in Hungary. Basically, even before the EU accession, the, 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 the Few big company came in. They bought the market, closed down the, hung, uh, the, the, the factories in Hungary. And right now, you can even buy a lot of sunflower, which is originated from Ukraine, because French factories are producing sunflower here in, in Ukraine, and they are re-exporting it to, to Hungary. It's it, it's a pain. Nobody would say that it's not a pain. But if you are looking right now, what you can find in Hungary? Uh, in Hungary, you can find a huge factory of the Audi company. This is actually the second largest engine uh, producing uh, factory in the world. Uh, you, and, and this is not only producing engines, it's producing all the Audi three cars you can, you can buy here. Or the TT, the Sport Coupe model, it's also uh, made in, in, in Hungary. Mercedes-Benz just just uh, opened a few years ago, two years ago, a, a factory, which is producing all the E, A, B, and the CL uh, models uh, in, in, in Hungary. There's a huge motor factory of the Opel and, 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 and Suzuki, and this is all, all in, in, in Hungary. So the, the question, what you would like to prefer, to get uh, a sunflower producing country or something with you know, a high tech industry, because Audi or Mercedes is not just Audi or Mercedes. It's all automatically other producers like Bosch or Brembo or, you know, these really high-tech companies are coming in and they are over there. So it's, it's really a very competitive uh, uh, economy. And, and, you know, the, the, the salaries in Audi are quite on a different level than what you can get at the sunflower industry. So it's, it's a very concrete in, uh, uh, example of, I, I think, for the pains and the gains. Yes, there are some pains, but I think if you are looking at the whole picture, the Hungarian economy right at the moment with all these complaints and pains are much more competitive than it was even uh, 10 years ago. 
and uh, and if you are comparing it with the, the Ukrainian economy, the the, the, the the difference is huge. I just was one week ago. I was in Zaporozhye, where the deputy head of the Oblast administration, uh, with a lot of proud, told me that in Zaporozhye region, in the Hu region, we have something like a little bit more than one uh, billion US dollar foreign investment. You know. One billion foreign uh, US dollar investment. There is a small city in Hungary. It's called Székesfehérvár. Nobody will probably know. It's it's a it's something like sixty thousand people. So I would say that probably in Székesfehérvár, uh, the invested money is four or five times more than in the whole Zaporozhye region, and it's only one small city. Okay. So this this was a very concrete example of of the of the pains and gains. Thank you. Taking into the consideration that Ukraine is now one of the biggest sunflower oil producers in the world, we can take this as a scenario. So in some 10 years, we'll be producing cars. First sunflower oil and then cars. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Natalia. Uh, thank you. And uh, I want to ask uh, the question, uh, as you said, a lot of uh, uh, maybe monopolists, uh, 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 entrepreneurs are not interested in the signing of this agreement. And in our country, they have a great influence for decision in decision making process. And uh, in the case, and uh, they can maybe not block, but slow down the process of implementation of this agreement. And uh, are there some maybe legal instruments from the EU side in order to control and influence the process of implementation of this agreement? Maybe are there some sanctions from the EU side? You know, in the EU side, we don't we don't like sanctions and things like that. We 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 try to uh, we try to do things in a, in a in a nicer way. We don't punish. But um, uh, you're right. I mean, there are um, a lot of um, influential people in this country who will try to block the implementation, or indeed are trying to block the signature. Um, <clears throat> and um, monitoring of the implementation is very important for both sides. Um, it's it it should be led largely by the Ukrainian government, because after all, this is, um, as, as I've said a few times, uh, this is a, uh, uh, th this should be about Ukraine. This should be about how Ukraine wants to transform its economy. And so it's in the interest of the Ukrainian government to make sure that that transformation is taking place in the way that's planned. Um, none of these uh, projects are ever 100% successful all the way through. There will always be problems in one area or another, and, 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 and the, the important thing is that in the majority of areas, things do move forward. We certainly will have a series of uh, ways of implementing the progress. Uh, we will have, we already have uh, certain meetings in, in uh, regularly between EU uh, uh, experts and Ukrainian experts on a whole range of different subjects. Uh, I, I'm involved in um, meetings on, on trade issues, on macroeconomic issues. Uh, we had last week in Brussels a meeting uh, between the customs uh, experts. We, have, we had uh, uh, last week uh, in, in, in Kiev a meeting on intellectual property rights, for example. So we, we have these, we will continue to have these, and we'll be focusing on the implementation. So, so this is important. But the resistance uh, is, is going to be tough. Uh, it has been in, in other countries as well. Uh, again, Ukraine is not unique in this way. Um, and, and again, I'll give you an example. Um, we already have a large project in place. Uh, it's around about 45 million euros uh, to help Ukraine in this area of transforming its uh, technical norms and standards. Um, it, it, it's been successful in the early stages. It's been running already for a few years, and it has a few more years to run. Um, uh, uh, under the old system, there were a lot of people who made money from um, um, awarding certificates for all sorts of products. In order to put a product on the market here, uh, a very wide range of products had to get certificates uh, to be tested at laboratories. All of that cost money. Um, and um, uh, 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 pe people made money from that. Um, but of course, that money and th those costs then had to be passed on to the consumers. Um, we're trying to introduce a system where there is more self-certification, where there's less requirement, that, that, 
that removes the potential for corruption in that process. And we've had some successes in breaking up some of the some of that. But you're right, there is there is resistance all the way through to people who don't want to change from the current system where they're able to uh, to make quite a, a, a nice uh, living for themselves from um, uh, abusing the system. And it, it, it's that that we have to tackle, but it will take some time. Any more questions, guys? Okay, last question. Hello, my name is Jura. Firstly, thank you for your lecture and answering the questions. Okay. And my question is about some problems uh, which were during the discussion and during the, uh, the signing of the agreement. Well, there are some issues where which needed a tough discussion and quite a long time for agreement uh, during the agreement was signed. Um, not signed, but during the agreement was written and right. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I mean, it took a long time to get to the uh, agreement that we now have on the table. It, it's a result of compromise. And during those negotiations, there were some very tough discussions. Uh, I have to say, particularly, again, going back to agriculture, uh, the EU side, we resisted bringing down some of our tariffs because, of course, um, if, 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 if I was sitting in, in front of a group of Polish farmers or French farmers, they would not be very happy about the agreement either because they would be saying, you've agreed something which um, is going to uh, allow Ukrainian products to come in and compete against our products. Uh, maybe at a, a at a cheaper price, so you know there are there are, there is resistance uh, to these things within the EU as well. So there were tough negotiations. I think the most difficult area was the area of the car industry, where uh, the Ukrainian negotiators fought very very hard to get all sorts of special rules for protecting the car industry uh, here, um, and succeeded to a certain extent because, as I said, they have a 10-year phase-in period, which is unprecedented in these types of agreements. We, we eventually agreed a 10-year phase-in period. Um, however, the car sector, I have to say, here um, is um, very successful in lobbying government to get all sorts of protective measures. There are measures in place at the moment which we would dispute as being compatible with Ukraine's WTO commitments. Um, and, you know, um, and I, I've, I've heard people from the Ministry of um, Economic Development and Trade saying this also, uh, no matter how much you protect a particular industry sector, it's not going to make people buy the cars. In other words, um, you, can, you can put in measures that mean that uh, imported cars are going to cost even more compared to locally produced, but uh, people still want to buy a Volkswagen or a Renault rather than maybe a, 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 a domestic uh, produced car, which is not of the same quality standard. The way that you sell cars is not to protect the market, but actually to improve the quality of the cars that you're selling, to invest in, in, in the businesses. And uh, um, but as I said, yes, uh, to, to get back to your question, I'm drifting again. Uh, to get back to your question, uh, the negotiations were tough. They took a long time. And in certain areas, uh, they... Um, we just had to reach compromises, but I can I can certainly say to you um, that um, the Ukrainian negotiators uh, were um, very hard in um, making sure they protected those vulnerable sectors of industry. And so sometimes when I hear now people complaining that uh, uh, you know this is going to cost a lot of money, it's going to be bad for Ukraine. Um, I actually feel sorry for the Ukrainian negotiators who did a really good job uh, in uh, making sure, as I said, it's an asymmetrical thing, um, that opportunities are there for businesses. Uh, they, they did a good job. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas, for a wonderful lecture and responding to our questions. Thank you for, to the audience to, to, for your attention. And we have to say goodbye to our online spectators. Thank you for staying with us and thank you for the technical team who helped us to make this broadcasting.
So we make a little break and then we come back. Thank you very much.